Welcome to the Science for the Public lecture series. Science for the Public is an organization committed to bringing science information and issues to the general public. Visit our website for our program listings and blog. Good evening, I'm Yvonne Stapp for Science for the Public and I welcome you to Contemporary Science Issues and Innovations. Tonight we're honored to talk with David Montgomery and Anne Bicklay, the authors of an important new book, The Hidden Half of Nature, The Microbial Roots of Life and Health. David R. Montgomery is a professor of geomorphology at the University of Washington and a MacArthur Fellow. He's an internationally recognized geologist who studies landscape evolution and the effects of geological processes on ecological systems and human societies. Dr. Montgomery is the author of three award-winning popular science books, and he's been featured in documentary films, TV, and radio programs, including NOVA and All Things Considered. For more about his important work, please check his website, and it's on our event page as well. Anne Bicklay is a biologist who works on watershed restoration, environmental planning, and public health. She works extensively with community and nonprofit organizations on environmental stewardship. These husband and wife authors of The Hidden Half of Nature have made an important contribution in the book that's our main topic tonight. They have emphasized the connection between microbial life in healthy soil and the vitality of ecosystems and the relationship between healthy microbial communities in the human gut and general health, including the immune system. Microbes matter. It's a great pleasure to welcome Dave Montgomery and Ann Bickley. Welcome, folks. Thank you so much for making time for us in this hectic schedule while you're on the coast here. Yeah, it's our pleasure, really. Great. It's a pleasure to be here. Okay. And could you please start us out with just what's soil? Because we're always thinking we should wipe it off of our <laughs> shoes, but it is kind of vital. Could you give us a little background? Sure. If you really want to get in trouble with a soil scientist, you call soil dirt. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so that's exactly what I called my book about soil. Yes. I, it, getting in trouble is not always a bad thing when you're right. raising awareness of something like soil, which is probably our most valuable but least valued resource. Um, if you think about what separates Earth from Mars as sort of yeah, a habitable yeah. environment, you know, there's obviously the atmosphere and water. Those are the first things that come to mind. But the thing that people don't tend to think about is soil. Healthy, fertile soil is really the, the catalyst that helps drive elements from the, the dead rocky crust of the earth mm -hmm. into the biological world. It's that, that frontier. Uh, we like to think of it as the marriage of geology and biology. But of course, right. a geologist and a biologist might think that way. <laughs> yeah. um, but that's really sort of the, the, the essence of soil is it's that transition between those worlds. It's, it's a dynamic catalyst that keeps the wheel of life turning in a very real way. And in terms of what it's composed of, in the book Dirt, and I believe in here, you mention, and I think most of us are not aware of it, rocks matter also, right? <laughs> so that marriage between rocks and microbes is fairly critical. And could you just give us a little understanding of how that becomes dirt? Yeah, I mean, microbes are one of the key factors in breaking down rocks. The more we've learned about that over the last few decades, the more we've realized how certain microbes can actually go out like little miners and prospect for certain elements Isn't that are something? that are locked up in rocks, get them out, get them into biological circulation, integrate them into their bodies, and then they can either trade them to plants or when they in turn die, it's actually in biological circulation. And if you look at the, all the things that make up living matter, the plants and animals yeah, that yeah. we know of as nature, um, a lot of it's obviously carbon, uh, there's yeah. nitrogen, oxygen, the things that, that plants can, can get fairly readily. 
but there's all kinds of other elements that are really critical to building the bodies of life that ultimately came out of rocks. Okay. Uh, and rocks don't break down very fast. I mean, yeah. if you take a rock, put it out in the sidewalk somewhere, you, you can keep coming back and find it in much the same shape for a long time. Microbes are one of the key elements that get those elements out of the world of geology and into the world of biology. So, in a sense, your nutrition goes back to some rocks, right? <laughs> that, 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 that a lot of these things, I don't know if potassium and, and phosphorus come from rock also, but that the microbes and the rocks work together to help provide the base for the... Yeah, so, and, and, okay. and both those elements that you mentioned ultimately came out of rocks. Okay. Once they get into the biological world, they can circulate through living matter to then dead things or organic matter that once it gets back into the soil, if it breaks down, can get reconverted into okay. elements in a form that plants can take back up. And that's where the whole idea of a wheel of life concept comes in, because microbes you might think of as sort of nature's recyclers. They're yeah. nature's little miners and recyclers. Um, and we depend on them for the ultimate source of much of our nutrition, but it's kind of a few steps back down the road before it gets to us, so we don't yeah. tend to make those connections. Right, so that's really very interesting. I'd like to recommend to viewers that, that there are parts of this in both. In this book, the new book, The Hidden, a uh, uh, hidden half of nature, and also in the great book, Dirt, which is just a, a gold mine of information. And uh, speaking of that, uh, we have destroyed soil a great deal. We're kind of aware of that now. But in the book, the earlier book, Dirt, you made mention of that. Could you tell us a little bit about that before we get to your garden? <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, the working on that book was what really sort of got Anne and I both into looking into the world of soil. Um, and I'm a geologist. I tra I'm trained to look backwards through mm -hmm. time to look at the history of life. And if you do, if you take the same kind of view to the history of civilizations, one of the things that you recognize is the profound importance of soil and soil fertility, sort of healthy, fertile soil as the foundation for thriving, prosperous civilizations. Mm -hmm. And it turns out that after we sort of entered the agricultural world in the sort of the post-glacial era of a, of a more, um, of a nicer climate, um, and we started growing a lot of our th food with agriculture, there was a downside to it. Um, on the upside, we sort of were able to expand our numbers, mm -hmm. feed more people. On the downside is that many of our agricultural practices degraded the soil mm. at a slow pace, but nonetheless at a rate that added up over the centuries. And if you look at a recipe for undermining a civilization, growing your population while degrading your ability to feed future generations is not a good recipe mm. for sustaining a, a civilization. So in the Dirt book, I looked back at the history of societies, how they treated their land, and came to the conclusion that the way people treat their land over time will look, determine the ability of the land to sustain those very people. And it's, it's you know, in, in, that there's a relationship between societies and the soil that influence each other. And uh, that, that was a bit of a revelation to me of mm -hmm, sort of looking mm -hmm. through the history of, of humanity. You can think of the state of the soil as, I like to think of it as the long wavelength periodicity of the rise and fall of civilizations mm. is influenced by the health and state of their soil. If you have a lot of soil in a small population, a lot of fertile soil, it's a recipe for growing a population. Mm -hmm. And once you get to the point where you've degraded much of your soil, uh, it, is a, it sets up a recipe for instability. It makes the societies vulnerable to climate shift, droughts, mm -hmm. for example, <laughs> or climate shifts like we're undergoing today, um, or hostility with one's neighbors, um, those kinds of effects, which are the things that we see in history books when we actually look at it. But playing out underneath there is really essentially our relationship to the land and its ability to support us. Yeah, and, and that is really fascinating because we don't usually think of that, we don't make that connection with the ends of these civilizations. So that is really great information by itself. Our forefathers did this on a pretty regular basis long before industrial agriculture because they didn't know. But now we're learning quite a bit. And Anne has developed considerable expertise about <laughs> restoring soil. 
And in this book, you have this wonderful narrative of constructing soil in your backyard. Could you tell us how you did that? Sure. Um, well, I had very much wanted a garden shortly after we bought a house in Seattle. And it took us a few years to get going on things. And uh, it was sort of a little bit of a debacle as we got going on our garden project because there we are near the middle to end of August. And that's where we landed on getting hundreds of plants into the ground. Mm. As we're digging, we're encountering two problems. By this time in Seattle, even though it rains a lot, by the time August rolls around, the soil is really pretty dry. And we also encountered uh, glacial till, which is a concrete-like layer in the soil. In, on our lot, it's anywhere, you hit that about anywhere from eight to 12 inches. Oh. So we're getting these plants into the ground and it is turning into a watering nightmare. And I thought, we need, I need, because I'm, I'm, I'm really more the gardener. Okay, I'll recruit him to do some <laughs> the lifting and things like that. Something. <laughs> yeah, but I thought mulch. I need mulch and a lot of it and right away. And we had sort of blown our budget on the plants themselves. And so I thought, what is close by, cheap or free, and that I can haul home? And so. Kaching kaching, I began to think, okay, let's see. Um, I'm hearing uh, arborists in the neighborhood. And so they fill up their truck with wood chips and they otherwise have to pay to dispose of that. I would call them and say, no, how about you come and dump your wood chips in our driveway? So that was one source of um, organic matter to make mulch. I also collected a whole lot of coffee grounds from- In Seattle, coffee from, grounds. Right, right. That's a plug. Yes, and uh, I think I counted a tonnage that I hauled home, uh, and it was something like, you know, Starbucks will package up their spent grounds in a bag about oh, this size oh. by this size, and I think I, estimated somewhere around, I don't know, three or 400 of those bags this over the, cor the course of maybe um, 18 months or so. Yeah. That was, I'd mix that with wood chips. And then um, as fall came around, leaves are falling. Yes, that is some of right. the best yeah. uh, mulch material in the whole world. And I, it just breaks my heart every time I see people binning up their leaves yes. and setting them on the curb to be yes, taken away. Yes, it doesn't make any sense, right. And they, I understand people have space problems for storing their leaves, but if you just let them sit for a couple of months, they, they quickly sort of, you know, degrade, de yeah, yeah. depress in volume. And so I would mix various things together along those lines, wood chips, coffee grounds, um, and other things, and then layer that mulch on the new garden beds from anywhere, you know, from say this depth to maybe upwards of this. and that was doing a couple things. It really cut down on the amount of watering we were doing. Ah. So that was the key thing. And also, I hear a lot of gardeners who say, well, I have trouble with weeds. I tell you, yeah. weeds, it's a tough weed that makes yeah. it up through that yeah. much mulch. And by the time they do, um, they're pretty worn out and I can just go and pull that weed right. Um, right. very and easily. It becomes a part of the organic garden too. Right, right. One of the best things, uh, this was all new to me, was the organic soup. Yes. So so here you get, you're getting a recipe for how to do this, and then on top of this you add? Soil soup. It, you might consider it um, a little bit like a probiotic mix for your garden. And in this case I had um, worm castings from the worm bin and you put that in a container, and a five gallon container, you aerate that water and you add a nutrient mix and all of the microbes, bacteria, fungi, all of the things that are in that um, worm compost then begin to multiply. Their populations begin to grow because they have a food source. And I let that brew for anywhere from 12 to 48 hours. And then I have a special um, sprayer and I'll put my uh, soil patented, soup. Patented, <laughs> patented, <laughs> I'll put my soil soup in a watering can or a bucket of some sort, put the sprayer end into that bucket, and then I can go around the garden and spray my soil soup elixir. And I have to say, um, 
roses, I really notice it with roses, which in the Northwest are prone to funny little uh, blights and oh. molds and things that get on their leaves. And every time I fall down on soil souping the roses, these things creep back up on the leaves and the petals. But when I do spray it with soil soup, they don't come back. And there's a, there's a bit of debate amongst um, researchers and scientists who are really looking at soil soup because all of these brews are different. Mm -hmm. You know, sure. my microbial populations are different than the neighbor's microbial populations in terms of, say, the worm compost that we're mm -hmm. using. Mm -hmm. So it's uh, not entirely replicatable. All I can tell you from uh, anecdotal evidence in our garden and my own observations is that it really does mm -hmm. seem to work for certain problems, mm -hmm. and I don't think it has done any harm. Right. That brings me to the subject of the microbes themselves, and you are uh, and the worms that as as a great contribution. You mentioned first of all, I should ask, uh, how long did it take you to get that soil built? Yeah. Go ahead. Well, we first started seeing changes within a few years. It was starting okay. to get darker. After it was about five or six years when we eventually dug a hole and found that there's almost two inches of relatively, really pretty good new soil on yeah. top of that glacial right. till that Ann mentioned earlier. Right. Um, so it was surprisingly fast. Yes. And, and this is what got right. us starting to think about, well, what was doing this? How is this, how is yeah. it possible to actually start building soil and restore soil in years, not the centuries that it yeah, takes nature not to build geological soil. time that we're exactly. <laughs> used to, right? <laughs> and you know, the more we looked at it, the more we thought about it, um, the more we realized the really foundational role of microbial life in breaking down that organic matter that Anne was adding to the yard and turning that back into the raw material that was fueling an explosion of life above ground and also other organisms that started yeah. to come back and build on that microbial foundation. Right, could we talk about that, can I draw that out just a little bit? The first of all, in the book, you spend a good bit of time relating the, well, should I say, emphasizing the importance of symbiosis. Right. That may be an unfamiliar term. There's somebody rather famous associated with this who took a lot of heat for a long while, but it's widely recognized now. But this is a, a running theme in your book, and even when we get to the health aspect. But you, so you've got microbes, but it's not just, microbe A and microbe B, right? Could you give us an idea of those communities, the symbiosis uh, sure, factor sure. in there, and then how that developed the, the, how the earthworms came back and how everything else came back? Sure, how about, I'll, um, I'll start off and then Dave has a great um, analogy that, that he uses for, um, for all of this. So uh, symbiotic relationships or symbioses are uh, merely ecological relationships where two organisms or two communities composed of different organisms actually each um, are interacting with one another typically in ways that benefit each one so that you know community or microbe A uh, and community or microbe B when they come together and interact they're accomplishing things that neither one could do by themselves right. so it's a it's a partnership really is what it is. And this is a, a very different way to look at um, evolution because for such a long time, uh, it's been ingrained, I think, in a lot of us that evolution is a process of competition and butting heads yes. and it's this organism or species overtaking this one. And it, evolution is really a process that happens along a continuum. Depending on you know the size of an organism, say a, a big elephant or something like that, versus a little tiny microbe, these kinds of life forms are doing all kinds of different things in uh, the process of surviving and reproducing. And so with microbes, which are these invisible single-celled organisms, they don't have you know teeth and claws and they're not conquering and, and killing things the way we think of, um, say, first order predators like you know lions or something like that. Mm -hmm. So with the microbial world, that's where symbioses really, uh, really seems to be strong. And there was a brilliant biologist, um, 
uh, unfortunately now deceased, Lynn Margulis, mm -hmm. who came up with a theory called symbiogenesis. And that was, um, she laid out a way in which long, long ago, billions of years ago, two microbes came together and did the unthinkable. One ingested the other, but both survived. And um, if you, if viewers want to look into her work, we'll there's a whole, the there's a whole story there that is absolutely fascinating. And so Margulis followed this thread, and she came to see that indeed symbioses that had begun in the microbial world led to the so-called higher forms of life, the multicellular organisms, the likes of of all of us here, our cats, our dogs, our our pet goldfish, and so on. And Dave has a, a interesting thing that that he observed sort of about symbiosis and the order in which life returned to um, our yard af you know, shortly after we had really gotten going on the garden. Yeah, you know, as, as the garden developed and the, the, the soil was changing and the plants were changing, we noticed different animals coming back to mm -hmm. the yard and there was a sequence to it. Um, you know, the microbes obviously we didn't see, but, we were, but Anne was adding them and, and feeding them with the organic mm -hmm. matter. Mm -hmm. And then worms started to come back, mm -hmm. and then um, arachnids came back, the spiders came back, and then the birds that ate the spiders, uh, and ultimately all the way up to an eagle that came to eat the baby crow from the crow <laughs> family that was eating the worms that came back to the lawn. So we sort of got back to our apex predator in yes. Seattle. Yeah. Um, and the order in which those things happened struck me as familiar because it was very similar to the order in which life evolved on Earth starting from the microbial life on, on mm -hmm, up through mm -hmm, certain mm -hmm. um, to um, more complex more complex organisms and and and, and the parallel is actually quite striking mm -hmm, the time mm -hmm. scale of course is completely different you know it took mm -hmm, 10 mm -hmm, years mm -hmm. in our yard um, and we're talking about hundreds of millions of years on the on the continents mm -hmm. um, but what it really emphasized to, to us is the role that microbial life plays as the foundation for mm -hmm. ecosystems. That ecosystems assemble from that microscopic yeah, bottom-up uh, level, yeah, if you yeah, will, and that yeah. those higher, higher levels of complexity are in great part supported by those lower levels of diversity and interactions. And the parts that we just sort of learned as we looked into other people's work in, in writing this book was, was the real importance of partnerships between microbial life and some of those higher mm -hmm, order organisms. Mm -hmm. For it turns out that when you look into those relationships, say in the root zone of a plant, there's particular microbial communities around the roots of particular plants that are very different. And it, it's kind of you know odd, what are they doing there? And it, it's an incredibly rich zone of life, it's a zone called the rhizosphere, the zone around the roots. Mm -hmm. um, it's the most life dense part, one of the most life dense areas on the planet, or right around plant roots. And it turns out that plants actually push out through their roots sugars and proteins out into the soil that feed those microbial communities growing in their root systems. And you know, you'd wonder why would plants do this? Mm -hmm. It's not a terribly good strategy to capture solar energy and then just go give it away. Unless, of course, the plants are getting something back in mm. return from those microbes. And it turns out that um, one of the things we learned in researching the book was not only that plants will put 30 to 40 percent of what they capture through photosynthesis out into the soil to feed those microbes, but that those microbes consume it, turn it into metabolites that turn out to be things that are very beneficial to the plants. Things like plant growth promoting hormones. Um, some, of the, some of those microbes will help solubilize phosphorus that's in the soil, or they'll, they'll grab um, nitrogen out of, out of, um, uh, that's locked up in the soil, or will help, right. help degrade organic matter and return those nutrients back into plant available forms. So by feeding the microbial life, those plants are essentially outsourcing uh, chemical factories, if you will, in the soil, outsourcing contracts to chemical factories right. that in return supply them with things that promote the growth of the plant. And you have there a, a virtuous circle. The plants are promoting the microbes, the microbes are promoting the health of the plants. Uh, and that's an example of the kind of symbiosis that Anne was mentioning. Exactly, and why your garden was so incredibly healthy without the need of antibiotics or anything, right? right. But yeah. which takes me to this other question. It implies that modern agricultural methods 
are radically different from this. And do you see that in the root systems of plants, crops, uh, from that are grown in the modern agriculture, these huge uh, monocrops and things that are non-organic? Yeah, one of the things that um, one sees in terms of, of plants that you apply a lot of fertilizers to is they yes. then, they, then, they kind of have it easy. Right? They don't have to work so hard to get the big nutrients, the nitrogen, the mm -hmm, phosphorus, mm -hmm, the potassium mm -hmm. that we're feeding them uh, in those fertilizers. And so they'll cut back on the exudates that they produce. They're not trying to recruit as many microbial mm -hmm. partners. Now, the problem with that is not that you can't grow plants, because we all know that mm -hmm, fertilizers mm -hmm, can mm -hmm. grow bigger plants. But what about all those micronutrients, the mm -hmm, other mm -hmm, elements mm -hmm, that mm -hmm. the microbes are helping to get from the soil and into the plants? Um, the copper, the cobalt, uh, all the sort of the, what we call the, the micronutrients, those other elements mm -hmm. uh, that are ultimately coming out of the rocks or out of recycling organic matter. Mm -hmm. So when the plants, when crops close down their exudate faucet, they sort of turn that down in the soil, the microbes that were specialized in eating those exudates and producing things that benefit the, the growth and health of the plant they don't thrive. Mm -hmm. You'll get other microbes will be will be will be more prevalent, uh, and so that changes essentially um, the the nutrient acquisition army that the crops would would have had, and so you do see differences uh, in terms of of what the micronutrient cycling in the soil. Mm -hmm. There's been major decreases in micronutrient content of crops in the last century, but of course that's complicated by new crop varieties that are bred for high yields rather than they, rather than nutri yes. nutritional quality. Right. Um, and there's also the question of, you know, if you continuously go for high yields, are you depleting the reservoir of nutrients in the soil? So there's, there's lots of things other than this microbial connection, but the science dots in terms of all the the, the mechanisms through which this can work are pretty well connected. Uh, in looking at the way that if you f fertilize crops and they get lazy, if we can anthropomorphize them for a minute, yeah. um, this connection to their, their microbial partners gets weak. It's, it's not necessarily broken, it just gets soft, it gets lazy. Right, right. Yeah, I just, yeah, I just want to put a, a point on something and that is uh, the other thing that happens when plants get fed fertilizers and they, they stop producing these exudates, mm -hmm. which cuts down on the food supply for all of these microbes that are congregating around the roots, is that those microbial populations begin to die off. Mm -hmm. And with that is all of these metabolites, these microbial metabolites that are functioning to the plant as signals about a number of things. Um, nutrient concentrations in the soil, the presence or approach of pathogens. And so what that means is we're sort of taking away a plant's defensive system. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, okay, mm -hmm. and this is, this is the big problem because here you have this gorgeous, luscious plant stuffed on fertilizers, and we've all seen, gardeners and farmers have seen what fertilizers do to plants. I mean, it's like gorgeous, right? Except, oh, well, on the top. On the top, <laughs> except that um, that also is like a banquet table for pests and pathogens. Yes, who come, so you need the other. Right, who come uh, running to this defenseless plant, and then that puts us in another bind, which is we're very concerned about our gorgeous, luscious plants, and so then the poisons come out to kill the pests and pathogens that have come running to the plant, and with the... Um, microbial populations that formerly were present, it's like the gates are wide open and in come the marauders and down comes the plant unless the poisons come in. And right, so, right. as Dave mentioned, a sort of a virtuous cycle, there's also all of these negative feedbacks once we begin starving the soil of organic matter, which then causes these microbial communities to plummet. Thanks for emphasizing that because we do get a lot of propaganda about how it is absolutely it's two things that are essential. You have to have these enormous monocrops. You have to do it this way. We'll get a new genetic variation to solve the plant problem, whatever its weakness. The the and the other is you've got to spray it all to death. You know the, to get rid right. of the things. And what you did was restore the system in the first place, which right. eliminates the need for the. Right. 
fertilizers and everything else, the right. pesticides. Everything goes back to the soil. And yeah. if you have a healthy soil, you have an abundance of microbial life, as well as you know larger forms of soil life. You know earthworms and those roly yeah, polies, right, and right. you know we call them the chewers and chompers. So when soil is healthy, plants are healthy. Yeah. You cannot have a healthy plant without healthy soil. Yes, and that, that then that health transfers to us. And I would just uh, like to point out also, and I'll make sure I show that you have a, an illustration in here of attenuated roots. So you might have this gigantic plant right. from right. the hyper uh, uh, fertilizer up here, but the, the, the roots uh, are attenuated. And then you point out the entire biological community is somewhat devastated down below there, that it really adds to the nutrient nutritional value of right. the plant, right? right? You want to... And, and the, the other thing that, that um, an over-application of fertilizer does is it, it, it increases the pace that the organic matter in the soil is degraded. Ah. And you can think of organic matter in the soil as the batteries for the microbes. It's the fuel source. And so it, one, of the, one of the other um, unintended consequences of fertilizer-intensive industrial agriculture has been that the organic matter content of our soils, that the, the, the batteries for, for soil life, have been depleted by a factor of about 50% in the U.S. And it's probably a reasonable number globally as well. Yes, yeah, and from these, these agri super agriculture, uh, industrial. And ag what that means is that if, if you look at the, the organic matter as essentially the fuel for the microbes that are helping facilitate the processes that build soil fertility, then the more fertilizer we over apply, the more we need to apply because we're degrading the natural reservoir of fertility. Now, and if there was an infinite source of energy available right. yeah. at yeah. at no environmental cost and infinite supplies of micronutrients, that wouldn't be a problem. But none of those ifs are true. Okay. I want to ask you in our time about now the relationship between our health and this, and here you've made this connection. And to my knowledge, it's the first time it's all been put together. All the dots have been connected. So we start with you build a healthy soil that creates very healthy nutritional uh, produce from that, correct? Mm -hmm. And then the, we eat that stuff, and we've only recently come to understand that we have a microbiome in us, and right. we really depend on it. And we've discovered this at a time when we have, as you pointed out, a lot of chronic diseases replacing, in a sense, diseases that used to be, you know, from particular germs or viruses or whatever. And we've solved that problem in a way. But now we have diabetes, we have all sorts of things, and you're suggesting better check that microbiome. Right. You have two very interesting stories, uh, your own health things. If you tell us about that and the relationship to this microbiome, I don't think that we have a lot of knowledge in the public about our gut, how important that is. So tell sure. us the health part, please. Yeah. Um, in the middle of writing this book, I learned that I had uh, cancer, that it was malignant, and that it was caused by a virus. And this was huge pause for thought, especially that it was caused by a virus because we had just been through this experience with our garden and soil where microbes were absolutely essential mm -hmm, to mm -hmm. the good health, not the bad health mm -hmm. of uh, the soil and all of these plants. Um, as it turned out, I'm thankfully now fully recovered and healed from that, but uh, I learned a lot about my own body through that mm -hmm, experience. Mm -hmm. And one thing in particular was the immune system, mm -hmm. my immune system and what a properly functioning immune system um, is like and what is it that it ought to be doing. Mine should have caught those cancer cells, but it didn't. And I began um, seeing different health professionals and one of them, uh, across all of these conversations, it was immune system, immunity, immunity. And I thought, well, I want to do something. What can I do to support and strengthen my immune system? So whether it's cancer or a cold, I want that kind of a health challenge. I want my body to work against that. And so 
Interestingly, the conversation um, turned to diet, and we dove deep into the human microbiome at this point. And it turns out that the root of a plant and the human gut share an awful Amazing. lot of commonalities. And it has to do with organic matter, microbes, what these microbes produce with what they're eating, and what the effects of their metabolites are both for a plant and in the human body. And so here's, here's how it works. We've talked a, a good deal about um, the roots of plants and this special zone called mm -hmm. the rhizosphere, mm -hmm. and it is chock full of microbial life, and there's constant signaling and communication going back and forth between, you know, that plant above ground and its root system. And deep down in the lowermost part of our gut, in our colon, also known as the large intestine, that is very much like um, that amazing? the root of a plant in that uh, the highest uh, diversity and numbers of the microbiota that compose our microbiome are found in the colon. So this is like the Amazon or the Congo <laughs> Basin. This is, this is, you know, the creme de la creme of our bodily ecosystem. And a lot of symbiosis too, yes. And like a lot yeah. of symbiosis okay. down there in the colon. And so we saw everything that was going on in the soil and we came to see um, a, a version, a different version of, of soil, if you will, down in our colon. And so what's happening is our diet feeds all of those microbiota, and it, we, need to, we need to remember that um, every life form on Earth needs to eat, mm -hmm. and it is mm -hmm. absolutely no different for all of these bacteria and other microorganisms mm -hmm. um, down in our colons. And what they thrive on most is complex carbohydrates. Your doctor calls this fiber, a nutritionist calls this fiber. And what was so interesting to us is that the fibrous parts of our foods, and so this is mostly our plant foods, it's not so much fats <laughs> and proteins, but it's the fibrous part of plant foods that um, pretty much escape our digestive enzymes. We don't actually make the proper enzymes to fully digest all of the whole plant foods in our diet. But sitting down there in our colon, the tranquil pastures of our colon, where you've got all of these microorganisms, and more importantly, their genes, their genome, which codes for a great number of enzymes that can break down plant foods. In fact, there's one, one bacteria that's, there's been a fair amount of work done. Um, it's called uh, Bacteroides theta iota omicron. I'll and that's try to remember a that mouthful, one. Yes, so we're is. just going to call that B theta. <laughs> okay. okay. <laughs> B theta makes somewhere around 260 different enzymes mm -hmm. that break down all of this plant material. And really, what this is, is this is organic matter that's coming into our bodies, much like all of that organic matter that I was spreading on top of our garden Isn't beds. Isn't that interesting? Right, and so in the soil, we have microbes breaking down all of that mulch, the wood chips, the leaves, the coffee grounds, all of that stuff. And likewise, deep down in our gut, we've got the same process going on, the breakdown of organic matter by organisms that have the enzymes to do this. And the metabolites that are produced in our gut many of them um, have medicinal effects in our body. And one of these compounds is called butyrate. Mm -hmm. And what uh, butyrate is very interesting because it's, it's being produced in our colon and right on the outside of our colon wall is where most of our immune system is located. And our immune system is uh, uh, in part composed of um, a variety of very different cell types with really specific jobs. And there's one kind of a cell called a dendritic cell that's a part of our immune system, and it's very cool. So what I'd like to point out here is, I'll just orient viewers here to our, um, the slide. This area called the lumen, this is the central cavity in the colon. So you picture your colon is a big uh, circle like this, and that interior area is called the lumen. This slide is a cross section, so we've taken mm -hmm. a cross mm -hmm. section through there. And you have a thick layer of mucus, and you've got uh, members of the microbiome that live both in the lumen and in the mucus. This here, these are cells, as it's described here, that line the colon. This is the outside uh, area of the colon. This is outside the colon wall mm -hmm. in your mm -hmm. abdominal cavity. You mm -hmm. can basically picture it. And this is the dendritic cell, 
which is this fabulous cell that uh, sits there perched right on the outside of our colon wall. And it's sort of an intrepid traveler, if you will. Uh, and the way it travels is it takes an arm and it slides it up in between these colon cells and it collects a sample, a molecular sample mm -hmm, of mm -hmm. the microbes. And it comes back down uh, out of the colon and it takes that molecular sample and it activates its PALs called T cells. And that's what, what's happening here. Uh, that molecular sample is called antigen mm -hmm. and particular kinds of antigen activate uh, particular kinds of uh, T cells. And in the world of microbiome research, um, there's two kinds of T cells in particular that um, have drawn a lot of attention and have been a lot uh, the subject of much research. And one kind of a T cell, this um, uh, image here sort of shows what's going on. One kind of a T cell is called a T regulatory cell, and that quells and dampens inflammation. Uh. You can consider that like maybe a fire extinguisher on a fire, okay? There's another kind of uh, cell that's a pro-inflammatory cell. It, it uh, begets mm -hmm. and starts mm -hmm. inflammation, mm -hmm. and that's called a TH17 kind of a cell. And you'll see what's happening here is that the dendritic cell, again, this, this sort of octopus-looking cell, grabs a sample from up in the colon, and it brings that down, and it activates a T regulatory cell. Dendritic cells also can collect other kinds of molecular samples from our microbiome, and those activate a TH17 cell. And day to day, normally, most of us are not walking around with cancer or influenza or something like that. You want inflammation at an even keel in our bodies because mm -hmm. when it's operating, inflammation's like a, um, it's sort of like an all-in-one wrecking crew is how we describe it. It comes in and it can take care of a pathogen or a, a, a inappropriate tissue growth or something like that. But that's a big job to do and it kind of, you know, elbows other stuff and things can get damaged when inflammation is happening. So you want that, that wrecking crew, go in, take mm -hmm. care of the problem, and get out as quickly as possible. And so the TH17 kind of a process fires up inflammation and gets it going, but then when that's taken care of, you want your T regulatory cells to fire up, come in and smooth everything back down and get inflammation back, uh, back down to this balanced state. And what's very different about um, this whole new view of our bodies and the immune system is that it's really the presence of certain microbes, uh -huh. not so much the absence all the time of certain microbes that is absolutely foundational for our health. Because if you think of it, what if we've got that dendritic cell, you know, on the outside of our colon wall, it slips through, it's grabbing a molecular sample, it's coming back down and it's showing that to, C to T cells. What if the kind of microbe that we need to activate a Treg cell is missing? Yeah. Or what if the microbial communities that sort of chaperone and, and, and usher in this whole process, what if they're scrambled? you can see pretty clearly right away that there's gonna be some miscommunication between these dendritic cells and the other cells in our immune system. And so you have, in this case, um, it appears that autoimmune conditions, you know, from asthma to diabetes to- Of which we have in abundance. Right, we have right. a lot of those kinds of conditions and diseases. And, and it's, um, and I just wanna pause here to say that much of this is correlative still mm -hmm. with mm -hmm. microbiome mm -hmm. research. We don't have the causal linkages all worked out, but we have some pieces of that mm -hmm. worked mm -hmm. out. And so it looks like that's the direction in which things are headed. And it will take more work to work out um, all of these connections. But uh, just going back to diet then, this is why it matters so much about what we eat because that feeds our microbiome and you want a microbiome that is, you know, as fully functioning as possible as we can have it here in our modern world, that is, 
so that we have the proper chemical signaling to uh, activate, you know, our immune system as it should be activated when we when we need it to be. And this is very interesting that you've pointed out that things that are uh, just at uh, just at huge uh, levels now, um, the American diet travels to other countries and the next thing you know we have record obesity in, in countries we've never had obesity in, diabetes to all sorts of problems that have been linked, as you say, still correlative in some, in some cases, but that look as though the diet, our diet, uh, is really um, a major factor, which is interesting because in the medical community uh, there is a great emphasis these days on genes. So if you have a broken fingernail, there's a gene for that. If you are obese, there's a gene for that. Cancer, there's a gene for that. For everything, Ch cholesterol, as I'm going to ask you about here, uh, it's it's all yeah. genetic. But what you're suggesting is if you get this thing straight, your immune system gets back to work. That's very interesting. Yeah. And, and it's, it's, it's good to mention too, you know, each one of us and every viewer out there has um, a different internal ecosystem in mm -hmm, terms of mm -hmm, our microbiome. Mm -hmm. We have a different genome. We live in different environments. So it's really a constellation of <laughs> factors. Our environment, our microbiome, and our genes. And it's the interrelationships mm -hmm. between That's those three right. things that, that sort of really influence our susceptibility. But diet is such a um, big factor in all of this because it affects our microbiome. Mm -hmm. It probably mm -hmm. affects mm -hmm. our gene expression. And we know certainly the way that we grow food and the type and amount of chemicals that we use, that interacts with our genes. So it's really this big, you know, milieu, if you will, of, of, of everything that affects our health. And the microbiome is just sort of the latest thing, but it's very, very informative. It, it, it really is. And before we leave that, because we're going to run out of time and I need to ask you about the what, what can be done in the future, but Dave, you mentioned in the book that you had some various medical problems. She's imposed a diet upon you here. <laughs> and uh, tell us about that, if you would, please, and then we'll... Yeah, you know, um, uh, Anne had a great influence on changing up our diet as a result of learning many of these things. And um, I mean, my doctor had been telling me for years to eat more fiber, but I'm not very good at just following orders. <laughs> but once you understand the mechanisms, the connections, sort of why that is, and once I understood that, oh, I would be eating fiber to feed my, the microbiome mm -hmm. in my gut, which would then be doing things to quell inflammation that would benefit me. I was like, oh, that makes sense. Uh, so over the course of about a year and a half after we started ch changing our diet, I noticed some very significant health improvements of my own. I had been on cholesterol medication. Like I'd, a lot of people. Like a lot of people. My blood pressure was too high. Like, like a, lot a lot of people. people I had, for a while, I took little purple pills to try and address acid reflux, like a lot of a lot people. Of people. And you know, once we shifted our diet to a more plant-rich diet, which is, we didn't give up anything. I mm -hmm, still mm -hmm. eat meat, we mm -hmm, eat dairy, mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, the full spectrum. But we shifted the balance of what we eat mm -hmm, so that mm -hmm. once you think about, you know, the, the first thing to do is feed, feed. your microbiota. Right. Make sure that they yeah. are healthy so you can be healthy. That gives you a different way to think about what you order at a restaurant, mm -hmm, uh, what mm -hmm. you make at home. Uh, and I, I lost a lot of weight. I'm not on any prescription medications anymore. My cholesterol came down, my blood pressure came down, um, my reflux went away. And you can't sort of necessarily connect all those dots to the change in diet, but the coincidence was pretty striking. I think right. exactly. Um, and, exactly. And the theory behind it all makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. um, those connections, once you view it through restoring um, uh, your gut microbiota, it actually makes a lot of sense because it, for them to for for that biota to be healthy, um, they need to be fed like like all ecosystems. Um, yeah. And uh, you know the the changes were striking that we noticed. You both look very healthy, I must <laughs> say. <you. laughs> but I think it is a bit of a revelation be, uh, that a uh, very common chronic disorders like high cholesterol, blood pressure, these kinds of things that just about everybody has anymore, you can attribute to diet down the line, whereas we've been 
um, encouraged to think that we have to go get medication, right? And right. you're going to be on right. long-term medication, which just complicates the thing more and more. So there's a solution out yeah. there, possibly. Right? Yeah, and there's there's a difference sometimes between treatment and prevention. Yes, uh, and, right. And a change in diet won't be a treatment for everyone. Right, right. But it is the one thing that we all have readily at our disposal that does matter that we can, exactly. in fact, influence through exactly. our daily choices. Well, this brings me then, because we're going to run out of time, unfortunately, Unfortunately, to the issue of that most of our food is coming from big ag, right? And that has a very different treatment of the soil that may have an effect on the actual uh, nutritional, the net nutritional value of what comes out of the ground and animals and everything else. In terms, if, if you could restore the soil, is that possible, uh, you know, on a large scale? Are people trying to do it? Because we're told, no, you can't do that. Yeah, well, not only is it possible, I just wrote a book about it. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, it comes out in May, it's called Growing a Revolution, Bringing Our Soil Back to Life. And what, okay. I, what it did is, you know, watching these revelations uh, from Anne Transforming Our Yard and looking at the history of ancient civilizations, mm -hmm. Um, made me ask exactly the same that question. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Could we restore soil at a large scale, at a scale large enough to actually influence the food system globally? Mm -hmm. uh, and what I did is I went around and visited farmers around the world who have been adopting practices that are regenerative, that rebuild soil fertility even as they intensively grow food. And I was really impressed because some of these people have restored their soil remarkably fast, you know, in a couple decades, uh, gone from, you know, a half a percent soil organic matter back to the native uh, mm -hmm. organic matter content, whether it's, you know, four to six percent in an African forest to 12, to, you know, to eight to 10 percent in some of the prairie states uh, in North America. And there's different methods that people have used to do this, but um, what I tried to look at are what are the common elements, what are the commonalities mm -hmm. between farmers and ranchers in different environments that really worked to restore their soil and restore fertility to their farm, and as it turns out, restore profitability to mm -hmm. their farms. And so you look at one of the things that has happened in modern sort of industrialized agriculture is that farmers got really good at growing a lot of a very few crops. Yes. And if you look at sort of classical economics, what does that do to, it'll depress the price you can get mm -hmm, for that. You mm -hmm, over mm -hmm. you produce a lot of something and the price will go down. Um, but the price of inputs that they've relied on increasingly for the last 50, 60 years, um, the fertilizers, the, the, the in pesticides, have gone up fairly dramatically, and actually. a limited number of seeds. Uh, right, and right, that's not right, even mentioning just, what they may yeah. be paying for proprietary seeds, which yeah, they used right. to not pay anything for. Right. Um, and who's, who is basically squeezed in the middle? It's the farmer, mm -hmm. because what they can get for their harvest has gone down, what they have to pay to grow it has gone up. So many of the people I visited were people who were sort of caught in that squeeze and were catalyzed by an eco a personal economic crisis to think differently about mm -hmm. how they were approaching mm -hmm. agriculture. Mm -hmm. And so they were trying to innovate in ways that would allow them to use fewer inputs. And the combination of practices that really seems to work uh, to build soil fertility is to cut down on soil erosion by going to no-till practices, mm. you know, stop plowing. Mm -hmm, and it's, mm -hmm. we talked a bit earlier about, you know, the, the, the undermining of civilizations over time, and the plow was actually a big piece of that, because if you plow the soil, it leaves it bare before the next crop, and erosion can happen faster than nature rebuilds mm -hmm, the soil. Mm -hmm. And if you lose something faster than you replace it, you actually can run out of it. Uh, it takes a long time to do that for the soil, but it can happen. Uh, so going to no tillage, um, and then many people will think that that actually requires uh, intensive agrochemical use, the use of herbicides. Many of the farmers I visit are not doing that. Mm -hmm. They're using other methods. They're using cover crops to outcompete um, uh, the, the, the weeds, the, much the way that Ann used mulch in our yard to keep weeds out of it. Um, and using crop rotations can actually have a big impact as well on the need for, for pesticides. Um, and so taking those three practices, no-till, cover crops that include legumes, things that will bring nitrogen mm -hmm, back mm -hmm, into mm -hmm. the soil, and then also um, a diverse rotation, so you're not growing the same thing, not setting the banquet table every year at the same time for the same yeah, organisms. Yeah. Uh, it's like our dog knows when his dinner time is mm -hmm. because he gets it at the same place at the same time every day. Agricultural pests aren't all that different. They can basically adapt to predictability. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So if you want, you want to be unpredictable in your rotation. The farmers that have adopted those three things 
really reduced their agrochemical use. Uh -huh. Many of the people I visited are not organic farmers. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. One place was an organic farm. All these practices work with organic agriculture. But where they can, re they can really transform is what we now call conventional agriculture. Because these people were reducing their, their chemical inputs by 50% to 90% and saving money doing it. So it was more profitable for them Mm -hmm. So they were like, well, why would I they, go back? Exactly, exactly. <laughs> um, and yeah. their neighbors eventually sort of look yes. and go, wow, right. how come you're like spending less time and less money right. and making more? Uh, that's kind of a magic combination for encouraging adoption. Right. Um, and some of these farmers are also bringing um, livestock back onto their farms uh, in terms of their ability to manure crops. Yeah. Um, and there's a whole movement for regenerative grazing practices that I also visited. But you know the new book sort of looks into those practices, how that they're they're feasible, and that we can actually grow a lot of food um, comparable to contemporary uh, conventional yields with these regenerative methods. There's a couple year transition that will occur on it's most farms that that, yeah. tran that make the transition. Right. Um, but after that transition, it becomes actually more profitable to farm more regeneratively. Storing soils globally could help us feed the world of the future. Exactly. Could help us conserve biodiversity into the future. Yeah. Could help us sequester more carbon into the future and could help small farms be more profitable right. in the future. It's, and it's, make us yeah. healthy. And They're make right. us healthier in, in the end. There are just innumerable silver linings yes. to restoring the soil. And I and I think what is so interesting about this is that all of the regenerative methods that Dave was just going through, they basically work because they are, you know, I talked about supporting and doing everything to help my immune system that I could. And these regenerative practices support and help soil life right. grow from yeah. the microbes all yeah. the way up to the earthworms. And so it's sort of like if we just give life a chance. Exactly. You know, Show a in respect. our yeah, yes. in our gut and yes, in the soil, that's right. we actually have a sort of built-in health plan, if you will. Yes, for right, the planet and right, us, right on yes. board in our bodies yeah. and in the soil. And so it's a matter of uh, protecting and cultivating that so that it functions and works for us like it was meant to. Right. Thank you so much for connecting the dots for us <laughs> in this respect. I hope. Everybody goes out and reads this. It's very readable, very interesting. And uh, the same with the others. I haven't seen the new book, but the old book, uh, Dirt, I do know. And uh, these are very readable and very helpful. And I hope it will reorient us uh, for, toward you know, respect for nature and uh, getting our health back in right. order. Thank you both so much. Yes, thank you very much thank for having us. Yes, thank you.